Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning to uh, all of you. Uh, I'm Sébastien Treyer, I'm the director of uh, IDRI, uh, think tank on sustainability based in Paris, and I'm going to be the moderator of this session on financing local action and resilient cities. What is the role of uh, subnational development banks? Um, a few words of introduction before I come to introducing our uh, extremely uh, eminent panel tonight. Um, building Back Better uh, is at the center of the whole Financing Commons Summit. Uh, but I think it's extremely important to add a territorial dimension, a local dimension to this conversation. Why is that so crucial? I want to give a few words on, 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 motiva on justification of what this, why this is uh, particularly important. Uh, we want to enable both reconstruction and transformation. Uh, that means that we want to exit the crisis, give a new impetus for economic redevelopment, structural economic transformation, prepare even possible reconversion of uh, uh, regions or metropolitan areas that might be specialized in one of, econ of the economic activities that have particularly suffered uh, with the crisis. So if we want to build more resilient models of development, re-diversify the economies or align the economies of these regions or metropolitan areas with Agenda 2030, we need to listen to the needs of the, of the people, of the population of these territories. Um, all these uh, examples that I, that I all what I'm, I've been quoting are examples showing that if we want to do that well, there is a, a crucial social dimension uh, that we are aiming at, be it about jobs requalification or the access to essential services. So yes, we need to listen to the needs of, of the population to redesign an economic project for a territory, for a region, for a city, uh, which is also particularly crucial in terms of democracy uh, and the capacity of populations and, and social groups to feel and to know for sure that they are part of the reconstruction decision. I can speak for my country, France, where not a lot of the citizens are really aware of what the recovery plans of the French government and of the European Union is going to deliver for them. And I think that's why this is a democratic challenge that we are also talking about, and not just a challenge about technical instruments. Of course, uh, we, we, we will be discussing that with specialists of how to make that possible. But I think you, I, I wanted to underline the political dimension of, of the conversation, conversation that we are having tonight. Um, so, um, I think it's, um, this is why I think that the idea to focus on local action on cities and regions and on the role of subnational development banks is extremely significant, both technically, uh, but also politically. Uh, and so if we are, when we are going to be discussing solutions and instruments, we have to have in mind both, uh, both dimensions. Um, so in this perspective, we have a wonderful panel, um, and, and I just want to begin uh, by presenting the person that is lacking in our panel. I'm sorry for the other panelists, and thank you very much for all of you that, who are there. Uh, but we were supposed to begin our, 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 our session with a key introductory statement by the Executive Vice President of the Government of Spain, Teresa Rivera. Uh, who actually deeply regrets that she uh, is not going to be able to be with us to, uh, to tonight. Uh, and I just want to insist on, on, um, um, on, on why we were intending to have Teresa to, uh, have a talk with us, because she would be insisting, she could have been insisting on the fact that we have a recent Spanish experience uh, uh, where a, a very important political dialogue was established at the scale of a Spanish subnational entity, uh, the autonomy of Asturias, to negotiate uh, a future without coal, um, both to ensure better economic viability for a region, uh, uh, for this region in the framework of Agenda 2030, at a time where the economy, uh, the, the policy, the, the viability, the economic viability of coal was not ensured, but also, of course, to protect climate. Um, and uh, what could have been very interesting is to hear uh, the Spanish experience about how you negotiate the pathway to get there. Um, of course, including the financing pathway, how do you, but not only about compensating the people, but giving a new project for the region of Asturias. So I think we can still bear this uh, reference in mind uh, for the conversation and the discussion. That could be a useful um, um, 
example or reference to, 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 to refer to when we want to discuss with the panelists. Uh, but I think what we, uh, the, the focus of the session is going to be on the critical uh, role uh, that uh, development banks can have in, in such, a, in such a, an endeavor to build back better, to give a new project for, for, for cities, for, for local governments, for local authorities and, and their regions. Um, and so the big questions of, 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 of these sessions are about what is the critical role, what is the potential of subnational development banks and then the critical role they could play um, and also to see if they already do today. What is, what is it that they already do today? What could they do better? And what are the main challenges for the future? How they could be also supported by the other scales of governance and the other players in the financial system? That's the focus of, the, of, this, um, of these sessions. Um, I think we, we need to bear in mind that the subnational development banks are explicitly mentioned in the uh, Addis Ababa Action Agenda from 2015. That was the other very important document accompanying the Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, of course, we could think of that, that the subnational development banks are um, naturally uh, important players because they are the last mile specialists in the architecture of financial players. But why are they particularly suited for transformation and reconstruction? And uh, if we want to align recovery with Agenda 2030, that's really what we want to discuss here tonight. And we are very happy to have uh, three eminent panelists, panelists with us and three videos from important players in the field. First, let me introduce uh, uh, Sergio Guzman Sushodolsky, who is the president of the Development Bank of Minas Gerais, uh, one of the Federated States of Brazil. Sergio, thank you very much. We are very honored that you are here and thank you very much for BDMG to have uh, uh, organized this, uh, this panel. My pleasure. It's my great pleasure uh, to join you today. Merci, Sébastien. Um, it's a great honor to um, join you uh, today. Should I do my speech now or? But if you, I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to present the two other panelists and then give you the floor. I'm very sorry, Sergio. I was, uh, my, my misintroduction, I'm <laughs> coming back to you in a minute. So we also are extremely uh, honored to have uh, Dr. Marie Pangestou, uh, Managing Director uh, of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank, because it's also very important to understand how multilateral development bank can connect to those local challenges and to the other players like uh, like uh, the BDMG in Brazil. And we also have with us um, Dr. Antonella Baldino, Chief International Development Finance Officer at the Italian, I would say the Italian National Development Bank, but actually it's called Casa Depositi Prestiti, which uh, is very similar to what we know in French for the Caisse des Depots, but you might also discuss if I'm right in, in naming your institution, the National Develop Development Bank of Italy. Um, we also have, uh, we are, we're going to have three videos uh, from the uh, uh, FMDV, the Global Fund for the Development of Cities, which is actually a, a network supporting lo local authorities to access funding. We also, also have a short video from the European Association of Public Banks and from uh, the Indonesian uh, Development Banks for Infrastructures, PTSMI. So that's, that's the menu of today. Uh, thank you very much for the three panelists to be here with us tonight. And I'm coming back to you. Uh, Sergio, sorry again for having misintroduced you. Uh, so, uh, so you're the you're the chair, uh, you're the president of uh, this uh, very interesting uh, development bank that is at the scale of a federated state in Brazil. Um, could you tell us how you support uh, the implementation uh, of Agenda 2030 um, through the investments of local authorities, of all firms at, at your regional scale? Uh, what are your perspectives for doing even better? For, for, for supporting the way that they could align their projects with Agenda 2030. And uh, maybe it would be also important for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for, for the, the participants to this session to understand if you see limitations uh, that you are facing and how you could be also helped to do, to do better. The floor is yours. Thank you, merci Sébastien. It's indeed a great honor uh, to join you today and my fellow uh, panelists, Madame uh, Pangestu and Antonella Baldino, good friend from CDP. Uh, I'm wearing two hats today as president of the Development Bank of Minas Gerais, but also the president of the Brazilian Development Bank Association, which reunites 31 development banks uh, and development agencies and other uh, commercial uh, banks and cooperatives uh, that have uh, development portfolio. I'm speaking from BDMG's 
headquarters in Minas Gerais. We are a 58-year-old um, uh, subnational development bank, currently serving 27,000 clients in 90% of the 853 municipalities of Minas Gerais and also in the seven neighboring states. Yesterday, during his remarks at the summit's opening session, our friend Remy Ryu highlighted three main takeaways from the excellent Visible Hand research conference that we also participated prior to this main event. In a nutshell, he pointed that development banks should act as platforms to generate positive impacts within their territories. Be prepared and have adequate conditions to operate and have uh, that need of enhance global coalition towards common development objectives of the 2030 development agenda. I couldn't agree more with his perspective because this is exactly what uh, our strategic approach at BDMG is. BDMG has been positioning itself as a development platform that provides a comprehensive set of financial solutions from credit to project preparation and this will uh, enable the implementation of SDGs in connection with local needs and priorities. We have also been combining a deeper specialization in the territory we finance with an enhanced use of digital tools. These two elements allow us to improve performance and reach a larger pool of clients on the ground through a more effective identification of sustainable investment opportunities. I would also like to uh, flag that BDMG has managed to expand its partnerships with regional and multilateral agencies and development banks, forming a coalition that helps cascade and assess adequate funding and technical expertise to generate positive impacts. Actually, we are about to expand this coalition with a new agreement with CAF, the Latin American Development Bank, um, which is a very important partner and an institution with great experience in financing local development. As a result, during the 10 months of the pandemic, the bank could design and implement an effective and SDG-aligned response. In the first uh, 10 months of 2020, we have expanded our disbursement by 160 percent, achieving the greatest level of disbursements of the bank's history. The resource available for small and medium enterprises more than quadrupled in the same period, and most important, SDG-aligned disbursement increased by 294 percent. In this period, we have also implemented a digital platform to finance municipalities and we launched a project preparation facility to support them in the design of high quality bankable projects. We have achieved more than 2.5 billion reais in disbursement and this was only possible because of the partnership with several development banks and agencies and I will reference at least a few of them uh, in this fight. EIB, the French Development Agency, CAF, Fon Plata, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Finally, I will conclude uh, here. Uh, in terms of the challenges that the seven national development banks face, I would like to highlight the need to work with new and more diversified pool of funding sources. The incorporation of new technologies to enhance our operational capability and better balance uh, between development mandate with long-term financial sustainability. And in this sense, we've been working with several um, guarantee funds to be able to operate at this scale. I will stop here and I'd like to thank for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you very much, uh, President Suchodolsky. That was uh, extremely interesting to hear all your, your experience and the instruments that you are mobilizing, and particularly the fact that you are measuring 
how your projects are aligned with the SDGs, which is a key uh, element of how we, we, we can have those metrics, and we have touched upon that in the uh, research conference, the visible hand, as, as you already also mentioned. I think we, I, I'd like to, uh, that we could hear now from the FMDV, FMDV uh, the Global Network uh, Supporting Local Authorities to Access Funding. Uh, the director of uh, FMDV, uh, Jean-Francois Habot, uh, uh, is sending us a video message to, to tell us about their experience of how they can help local authorities access funding. Please, could you launch the video? Good day, everyone. I'm Jean-Francois Abo, the executive director of FNDV, the global network of cities dedicated to promote solutions to finance and invest in urban development. Because of subnational development banks are playing a crucial role to finance the urban climate transition, FNDV have provided support in different ways since 2015. First, through the development of technical assistance to support SDBs in improving their services. Secondly, through the support to the African network of SDBs, the REAFCO, with training and peer-to-peer -peer exchange on different topics such as climate finance and private investment mobilization. Thirdly, through the advocacy um, support to have a better recognition of SDBs in the global agendas. And because of the increasing interest towards SDBs, we are convinced of the necessity to create a space of dialogues between SDBs and with the financial ecosystem of partners. For that reason, we have launched last year during the Climate Week in New York, the Global Alliance of SDBs with the first regional declination in Africa, where we are currently mapping the existing SDBs to better understand where they stand and how to improve the capacity to support uh, the uh, urban development. This work is one of the flagship programs of LUCI initiative, led by the Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, uh, also known as CCFLA. For all the, these reasons, I would like to thank Idri and AFD for the invitation to contribute to the Financing Common session on SDBs, and thank you very much. So that was, uh, to me, an interesting message from uh, this network that is uh, already organizing networks of uh, subnational development banks, particularly we heard in the framework of, of the African continent, but not only restricted to that. Um, I, I think uh, both uh, Sergio and uh, the executive director of FMDV have mentioned the necessity to be able to uh, link in the proper way with other levels of uh, uh, in the financial architecture, and we are very honored to have a uh, director Marie Pangestu from uh, the World Bank. Director uh, Madame Marie Pangestu is director of development policy and partnership at the World Bank. Uh, Madame Pangestu, how do you uh, at the World Bank support local authorities and cities, and how do you link your actions to subnational development banks? Uh, I mean, in the title of your portfolio, there is this uh, mention of partnerships. We have heard about dialogues. How do you substantiate that? What, what does that mean in terms of organizing the ecosystem of the different development banks? Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, allowing me to share our thoughts uh, to this event. Let me just say something about the context. Uh, I think the pandemic is highlighting the underinvestment in resilient cities and urban areas because we have seen how the, the pandemic uh, is actually, you know, the epicenter of the pandemic is in urban areas. And in developing countries, you're talking about overcrowded uh, living conditions, uh, people who lack uh, adequate water, sanitation, access to food or social safety nets lacking access to information and essential services. So it, it's highlighting something which uh, has already uh, been in existence prior to the pandemic, which is the low levels of private investment in muni municipal infrastructure and utilities. That, that has been a long uh, a major challenge to how we can improve service delivery in developing countries in the urban areas and cities, as well as, of course, addressing other development and climate change. So I think as, as countries think about building back better, building back resilient cities and delivery of necessary services should be part of the plan. And uh, what is the role of uh, subnational development banks in that? Uh, they can play an intermediate role to mobilize and channel financial and technical resources from donors to um, uh, and, and MD, MDBs 
to other financiers to the municipal level, given that I think one of the constraints is this ability of cities to borrow. So SBBs can play this um, intermediate role, as well as the fact that uh, ho hopefully uh, SBBs can bring to the table their specialized knowledge uh, of the municipal context, the local needs, the investment needs, and the risks, and step in where the private uh, entities are unable or unwilling uh, to do so. Uh, and they can really uh, uh, access the private finance, uh, hopefully in a sustainable and over a way and in over a long term. Uh, uh, they enter where the private sector will not enter. They need to be structured, regulated, and capitalized in a way to ensure squeeze in rather than squeeze out of private capital inflows. And uh, there's a range of systemic uh, factors and constraints uh, uh, in, in the ability of uh, subnational access to private finance and the effectiveness of SDBs that also need to be addressed. So let me just share with you a few ways that the World Bank Group is supporting SDBs. Uh, first, when there is a clear rationale for public sector intervention, uh, we are helping our client countries put in place the right regulatory and supervisory framework for state-owned financial institutions. Second, under the right conditions, we directly support the establishment and capitalization of SDBs or similar entities, such as our support to the Tamil Nadu Urban Development Fund, which uh, with other development partners, we have been able to finance 1.8 billion of municipal infrastructure projects. Third, we bring advisory services to strengthen the operating frameworks and improve corporate governance, such as supporting Vietnam's social bank for the poor. Fourth, we support the enabling environment by stimulating project pipeline and municipal credit worthiness. This is, uh, speaks to what Sergio mentioned as the cascade approach. We also adopt that. And I think that this is where uh, we need to, do, we can do more uh, here. For example, with other development partners, we uh, recently launched a gap fund, uh, which will unlock at least $4 billion euros for climate smart projects and urban climate innovation in developing countries. Getting projects uh, ready for the pipeline, that's really one of the big challenges. And finally, we provide the analyt analytical guidance to help SDBs scale up green finance as part of our advisory services on uh, greening financial systems. Uh, thank you, uh, and I will look forward uh, to today's discussion. Thank you very much, Madame Pangestu. This was also very clear about how you see the role of SDBs and how you support them under what conditions, but also what type of support the World Bank is, is already giving those types of players. Um, there, there is a, a, I think we, we could hear now from the uh, European Association of Public Banks, Philip Mills, who has uh, recorded videos about uh, the EU experience, uh, and particularly when we think of the Green Deal and the recovery agenda in, in Europe, how can we make sure that this is uh, corresponding to what is needed uh, in terms of implementation at the local level. So, Hello, dear participants of this very important conference. My name is Philip Mills. I am the chairman of the European Association of Public Banks since June 2016, and I am also the CEO of SPHIL, a French public development bank. European public banks, um, like any other public banks, public development banks, uh, are effectively being created for this kind of circumstances to be able to provide financing in any circumstances when commercial banks are reluctant to do so, when sometimes they are even unable to do so. So we are effectively providing financing in circumstances of crisis. How do we do so? We do so by effectively uh, in four different means. The first element, we just uh, expand uh, in a very considerable manner what we are doing usually. We expand our programs, we expand our procedures, especially to help uh, SMEs to be able to be financed in these circumstances. The second element is to be more specific. We have in several occasions uh, issue COVID bonds. We have issued COVID bonds in order to finance public hospital. We have issued COVID bonds in order to finance other actors which have been effectively impacted by this crisis. The third element of this strategy 
is to provide all the tools we usually provide to our clients. So loans, of course, guarantees, liquidity, and also all kinds of advisory services to our clients. So local authorities, municipalities, public hospital, social housing institutions, SMEs. So in a nutshell, what we have done is to be a counter-cyclical institutions who make available financing at very competitive conditions in any circumstances, and especially in these crisis circumstances. Yes, I just mentioned that we have a first role was to be counter-cyclical institutions. We have a second public policy mission, an even more active one, which is to be institutions which help to effectively increase, accelerate the ecological transition in the European economies, either by providing green or social loans or sustainable loans to different clients. So we have done that. We are, us European public development banks, at the forefront of this kind of financing. For instance, last year in 2019, we have been able to issue more than 10 billion euros of sustainable bonds of different type. We have issued since the beginning more than 30 billion. So by issuing 10 billion euro, we have issued 10% of the total issued in this kind of bonds and so the loans associated with for the whole Europe. I will give you some example. We have uh, people like our dear colleagues from Netherlands, uh, from NWB. We have, uh, of course, institutions of NRW from Germany. We have people from the Nordic states like our dear friend from Common Invest. We have people from Slovenia who have just uh, issued the COVID bond in October. What have we have done that? We have done that in order to provide financing. And if anything else, if anything we can say is that we have enough financing, but we are not enough projects. So we hope that to be able to use the different recovery plan of Europe and our national states in order to increase that part will be very useful for us. And of course, we want to do it in close cooperation with EIB, which is by definition at the European level, the bank who wants to be the bank of the climate. I don't know if I will use the word recommendation, at least as an association of public development banks, we can have suggestions. We have very much appreciate all the efforts made by European institutions, on top of it, European Commission, of course, European Central Bank, to introduce elements in order for us to be at our maximum efficiency. For instance, we have uh, a law on temporary regulation to be uh, postponed. We have a law to have more flexibility on the e EU aid framework to have channeled the aid from the state to the public development banks. I think with the crisis expanding, I think with the second wave of the COVID-19 infections, we need to see all these elements to be to stay in place for more longer than was expected at the beginning. That's the first element. The second element is, of course, that in the EU budget, all the different elements, all the different sectors which are useful for the EU economy should be maintained and should not be adjustment to the next EU generation uh, element, which has been decided by the different European governments last July. And perhaps finally, all these are very important with a clear regulatory in another dimension framework. We have the chance to have in Europe a taxonomy. But as it is usual, the devil is in the details. The taxonomy is a very good starting point, but now you have to have the delegated acts. And in these delegated acts, 
we need to have sufficient flexibility in order for all the different institutions, all the different economic actors to be able to participate to this transition to a more neutral carbon type of economy. Well, these were, these were interesting examples taken from, from Europe, and I want to turn to uh, another European colleague in the panel, uh, Director Antonella Baldino. You're the Chief International Development Officer at Casa Depositi Prestiti, um, and I think it's very important to understand, I mean, Italy is known to be a, 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 a very active network, that the economy of Italy is made out of a, a very active network of SMEs, I and mean, that might be a little bit overstated, seen from Paris, but that's that differentiates a lot Italy from France, at least. Uh, and it's also very regionalized politically and economically. How do you, uh, how does, uh, what is your experience at CDP uh, to, uh, as a national scale player to support local authorities and, and local economic players? And what lessons can be drawn for that for, for the international context? Yes, thank you. Merci, Sebastian, and uh, good afternoon. I'm very really pleased and honored to take part in this panel of the Financing Common Summit and to be able to share with you the experience of uh, Casa Depositi e Prestiti, or in short, the CDP. CDP is the Italian National Promotional Institution. We foster the development of the country using national savings responsibly in order to support growth and boost employment by leveraging on uh, innovation, business competitiveness, infrastructure, and local development. In its 170 year history, CDP has uh, consolidated a unique role within the Italian economy. Today, it pursues uh, its mission as a long-term investor and as a financial institution with a growing international perspective and an increasing role in development financing. So traditionally, CDP has had a national footprint with a specific focus on territorial development and financing local public authorities. Over time, our business model uh, of local action has evolved in uh, three directions, enlarging our scope from the public to the private sector, widening the range of financial instruments, including loans, guarantees, and equity interventions, developing a local approach based on effective financing schemes for social and sustainable infrastructure, for smart and affordable housing, for new technology and innovation, and for green energy, and circular economies. In our experience, an effective strategy for local action should be designed in order to create a bridge between public and private interventions, between public interest and the private capital risk appetite, and a vehicle to strike the right balance between public interventions and market rules. These are key ingredients to ensure sustainable territorial transformation, including intervention for resilient cities and a responsible recovery in the COVID-19 context. Within this framework, national or subnational, it's only a matter of perspective. If we consider our role in the European Union as an example, CDP is both a national player, but in a way also a subnational development institution. And from this perspective, we are able to appreciate firsthand the important role of SDBs, essentially for one reason. Local areas might be characterized by significant peculiarities in their production system and market structure, and by heterogeneous market failures. For SDBs, uh, we present, we think that uh, SDBs represent a bridge between our national policy goals and local needs, delivering tangible results 
at local level. And let me conclude by saying that um, in the COVID-19 scenario, SDBs are a core component of a model for the economy to be resilient and for growth to be, to be sustainable. Thank you very much, um, Madame Baldino. This was a, a very interesting uh, statement from, from, from the Italian example. And, and uh, really, I, I, I just want to emphasize what you've just said, that uh, uh, there is a, a bridge needs to be built between uh, national uh, political decisions and local needs. And that was what I was trying to introduce in, the, in my first talk. And I think that it's not usual to consider the financial players like SDBs to be uh, one of the key elements of the policy of the bridge between those political questions, and I think that's one of the one of the key elements. We still have a, a last video before coming to some uh, question and answers uh, by Edwin Siaruzad, uh, who is the president director of PTSMI. PTSMI is uh, um, the uh, in Indonesia uh, a national development fund for infrastructures. Um, and and I think they have a specific discussion about how they can help subnational governments. Good evening, esteemed CEOs of public development banks around the world, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly an honor for me to be given this opportunity to represent Asia on the topic of financing local action, particularly to share with you our own experience in financing municipalities in Indonesia especially in the time of COVID-19. PTSMI has been mandated by our government to support COVID-19 affected municipalities in Indonesia. Not only they have limited fiscal capacity and highly dependent on transfer from the central government, but also have limited health and infrastructure system in place to overcome the overwhelming effect of COVID-19 in the region. To fill in the gap, PTSMI is spearheading the Regional Economy Recovery Program, which is a long-term low interest loan provided by PTSMI, which utilizes blended finance mechanism to provide financing alternative to municipalities to increase their fiscal capacity so that they could continue providing or even better improve their provision of public services during post-COVID-19. The affected municipalities may use the loan to fund sectors such as water and sanitation, low-income housing, environment infrastructure, logistic and transportation infrastructure and social infrastructure like hospital, which is badly needed in the time of COVID-19. We expect that this program will contribute an additional output to Indonesian national economy, improving value added, additionally labor income and increase employment along with other social impacts such as better access to health facilities and improve sanitation. We believe that helping municipalities is key in reviving the economy from the bottom end. And therefore, we hope that through sharing our experience, we can inspire other PDBs to do the same. Thank you. So this was the um, th this was the the, the, the final uh, statement from from uh, this uh, Indonesian example, and I um, we have a, uh, probably around ten to fifteen minutes for for Q and A and your conclusion words if you accept to go a little bit beyond schedule. Um, I think uh, from my side I wanted to uh, launch a discussion among uh, among you three, um, uh, Madame Pangestu, Madame Baldino, and, and uh, President Sudolski about um, in two directions uh, maybe you can pick on the one that you that you think is, is most relevant one first thing that i i, I think is uh, is striking to me is to what extent um, aligning with agenda 2030 uh, in times of, uh, of covid uh, has, uh, is, is proposing two uh, very important challenges but that might be quite different from one another one is accelerating 
uh, the, the, the possibility to reach Agenda 2030 goals about access to essential services. I mean, the, N the NDG part of the SDGs, access to energy, water, uh, mobility, etc., uh, and food. Uh, so, so that's what Madame Pagesto was particularly insisting about, the, the fact that uh, we still need to accelerate and mobilize more money for utilities, and, and that's one specific challenge. Another part of the challenge is uh, when we, as I, that I was introducing in my first words, was that uh, on top of that, we need to uh, try and, and redevelop the, uh, some of the uh, economic sectors in some regions towards a, a different uh, type of business model, a different type of uh, economic pathway. Uh, if we want to be aligned with climate biodiversity and inequality reduction objectives within the SDGs. I'm not saying that they are different, but they might be two different, two, two, uh, uh, challenges, complementary challenges, but it's quite challenging to, to have to, uh, to look at both of them. So my question in that first part of the question was to say, w w is about how do you, um, how uh, ready are your institutions to deal with both? Uh, is it, a, uh, are you mainly focusing on one of them or, or uh, and how far do you see, uh, what is still the challenge for your institutions to align with these very important uh, Agenda 2030 alignment challenges. My second type of question is is more some is might be a little bit more anecdotic, but I noticed that some of the of you have mentioned uh, the problem of the fiscal capacity of local authorities, and we could also say the same about the fiscal capacity of national governments. Um, how do you, as as uh, financing institutions, how can you deal with that? I understand that uh, for some of you, the idea is to also help. Uh, the fiscal capacity of those local authorities? Are you, do you have instruments that enable that? Or more broadly, what is your relations with local and national governments? How do you support local governments? So maybe what I, I, I suggest is that you pick up on some of the questions that I've mentioned here or some others that you wanted to, to develop and uh, make your final statement uh, before we can come to, to a close. I, I think I will turn first uh, in, in the reverse order, first to uh, Madame Baidino at CDP. How would you react to the other things, the other messages that the other panelists have put on the table? Uh, maybe you react on the questions that are asked if you think they're relevant and, and give your final conclusion. Yes, uh, thank you. So how do we uh, react? Uh, I would say that with the COVID-19, uh, our institution has found uh, uh, its efficiency in uh, pursuing its uh, traditional uh, model. First of all, we are a long-term investor, which is I mean, something that is very important uh, in order to not only uh, look at the short-term uh, effect of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but also to, to, to look at the, how to relaunch uh, our economy. So first of all, we are a long-term investor that thanks to our specific business model, provide patient capital to the real economy, to financial instrument and maturity, which are consistent with non-speculative -spe return. And uh, deploying patient capital uh, in our intervention does not end with uh, only have a longer maturity, but also can be extended to the, the ability to look strategically ahead towards more distant horizon and perspective by carrying out promotional and development activities, so targeting the 2030 agenda. And uh, secondly, uh, in, in our uh, approach, it is very important to operate in uh, complementarity with the private sector, uh, rather than being in uh, competition with them, which proves to be very important also in this uh, critical phase of the COVID-19 crisis. We work alongside with the banking system, with the financial system, in order to favor a crowding in effect. Uh, a plurality of players that can only uh, be uh, efficient with a stronger coordination uh, as, I mean, we consider to be also with the, uh, with the SDBs. I would say that uh, in our intervention, uh, what uh, is highlighted is the importance of SDBs as an essential piece in the uh, mosaic 
to tackle the SDGs. A mosaic where a plurality of public development banks is in action, and there are, they are all heterogeneous in terms of governance, source of funding, financial instruments, regulation, and also main sector of intervention. It is ingenious that, uh, however, sharing a common goal, which is this, to support local and global sustainable uh, growth and development, will all have uh, a unique DNA, and we can only work efficiently with a strong coordination of priority and goals, and the cooperation among the different level of intervention, also following the already mentioned cascade approach. This is the perspective driving our work in Italy and also inspiring our commitment at international level alongside other partner institutions. We are at the moment where the global economy needs both a foundation of sound domestic policies combined with a firm commitment to international cooperation. We need these two elements the domestic as well as the international, to create a more resilient global economy with a sustainable and more durable and more inclusive growth. Just to summarize, I mean, what is our approach at the domestic and also international level? And partnership in this domain will be the name of the game. That's why we are here and we very much share the value of this uh, first, uh, let's say, first Financing Common Summit. Thank you very much, Madame Baldino. Uh, I turn now to uh, Director Pangestu. Could you just uh, give us um, your uh, reactions to what you heard in this session and uh, your conclusive words? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, and it's been very good to hear everybody speaking. I think our objective has always been uh, about, uh, you know, how can you achieve uh, delivery of essential services, which has always been a development objective, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, address uh, health and human capital issues and the environmental issues. And I think this uh, Building Back Better offers that opportunity. How do you design your programs, uh, have the right policy frameworks and institutions to achieve that at the national as well uh, as at the local level? And I think, uh, you know, I, I have been uh, working in this space for a long time, including in my own country, Indonesia. You heard uh, PTSMI uh, mention uh, what they're doing. Uh, but, you know, PTSMI, uh, I, I don't remember, one of you said it, uh, it was in the, one of the video recordings as financing is not the issue, but having ready made, having the projects ready is the big issue. And that's exactly the PTSMI problem. You know, we, they, they, we were able to raise $2 billion in SDG funds, I think it's called. But to find the, the ready made projects, uh, whether at national or municipal level, is has been a, a big issue. And here the issue is really about. Uh, on the one hand, the regulatory uh, and legal uh, issues that allow you uh, to, to have uh, the private sector come in or to, to be able to use these funds when the private sector doesn't come in is, is a big issue. And, uh, and I think this, need, this is where the World Bank uh, comes in uh, quite a lot with governments to work with the reforms that are needed uh, to have this happen. Uh, one, I, I would just mention a few which are very key. One is obviously land, land use. Uh, uh, and, and because land use and having uh, clear uh, certainty about land uh, laws and regulations. I, I heard that so many times when I'm attending all these uh, city uh, uh, development and urban uh, planning um, uh, events. And second is uh, the, the role of public, uh, the role of delivery of public services, whether it's water, electricity, to the extent you have private sector, public private partnerships, how does that work uh, when you have sometimes or many times you have a monopoly, a state-owned owned monopoly? How does that work? How can you? How do you reform the the, the monopoly that's often in the hands of the state? Um, and how do you have the public-private partnership that allows enough incentive and certainty for the private sector to come in? That's another big issue. Um, and there are many other issues, but I that I would pick those two just because those were the ones that that we found to be very um, very. Uh, very clear 
in in uh, not in enabling enough uh, public private uh, type of investments to come in or the cascade model you know the cascade model works on the principle that the upstream which is all the regulatory reforms need to happen and then you have the blended finance model which is a combination of you know multilaterals can come in to provide guarantee uh, and then you can have the other you can have SDBs you can have private banks you can have philanthropy even come in so I, I think that's that's the direction we should be going uh, but we need to do more work on the political commitment for the reforms to happen at the national as well as at the sub-national level and uh, it, it is not an easy space I, I think many of you work with cities know that there is a lot of um, let's say uh, the mapping of the interests uh, need to to be uh, to happen and how do you align them so that uh, you, you can get them to be on board and you know the participation of citizens to to make it all happen uh, I'll, I'll end there <laughs> thank you very much Madam Pangestu. I just want to mention that we had only one question from the from the chat that was about how do you make sure that we also uh, uh, listen to the local needs of the most vulnerable and uh, the mention was for instance indigenous women in tourism uh, in Latin America. I don't know if you want to uh, add something on that Madame Bandestu, maybe if that's something okay. that... Uh, just very briefly, I, I believe, uh, I'm a great believer in the role of communities. So uh, I, I do think we need to make sure that uh, whenever we are designing uh, programs, especially at the local level, it does have to, to take pay attention uh, to the local needs. And here is the role of communities, uh, the importance of involving uh, all the local communities, the vulnerable groups, the, the excluded groups, to make sure that you hear uh, all their voices and their needs. Thank you very much, Madame Pangestu. I now turn to uh, President Sushodolsky. Sergio, you, uh, to some extent, you had uh, your bank had the idea to convene this panel, so I leave it to you to uh, also uh, make the, the final conclusive words, uh, reacting to all you've heard, but also to the, uh, the, the, the question that came from the chat, because I believe that's also something that might be interesting from a Brazilian bank to, to hear about. Sergio, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian. Merci. It was a real pleasure to work with you uh, throughout the Financing Commons Summit journey. I believe this is the beginning of an important dialogue that will be that will hopefully contribute to building a more integrated and effective community of public development banks of all sizes, multilateral, national, regional, and uh, and and subnational. Uh, of course, we all share the same mandate and i think uh, many of us if not all of us uh, are aligned with the 2030 agenda the sdg agenda i will uh, try to tackle some of the previous three questions and uh, but on a, a very um, direct and objective uh, manner and provide perhaps our example as you know, uh, the 80s and 90s, uh, according to former president of the IDB, Enrique Iglesias, was the uh, era of the genocide of the development banks. And I believe that especially after uh, 2015 and now 2020, we are at a time of renaissance of uh, development banks in a different model in a 21st century development bank uh, model. And this is the at the heart of the importance of the panels that are being hosted, of the academic conferences, of the uh, papers that have been uh, published, and I encourage all of you to, to check the summit research uh, page, and also of the uh, Paris Peace Forum uh, for Solutions. We're actually showcasing our uh, digital uh, credit platform uh, tomorrow. But more importantly is the following. Um, following the three questions, first, uh, I do believe uh, that we need to have a diversified portfolio, very focused, but diversified, okay? In Minas Gerais, we serviced small, medium, large companies, but also municipalities, 853. Of these 853, more than 80% have less than 30,000 population. They're very small municipalities. They could not uh, uh, organize themselves. They don't have the tools uh, to uh, uh, be able to secure direct funding. But not only that, as some have uh, mentioned, they do not have the project preparation facility. And that's where uh, we go. We not only provide 
small, medium, and large uh, 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 financing for these uh, uh, municipalities of different sizes, from 5,000, 5, 15,000 to more than a million in the case of our capital. But we do project preparation. And in this uh, manner, we have partnered with the Inter-American Development Bank as a first partner to organize a facility that is already working and where we will integrate SDG uh, technology, and I'm talking about engineering technology, to a concession of road, a uh, very key one, 300 kilometers, that is in the heart of the metropolitan area of Minas Gerais. And we will offer that to the private sector uh, for concession and for investment. So therefore, uh, Public Development Bank is mobilizing private resources using SDG uh, technology. We couldn't be fulfilling uh, more our mandate, uh, I think, uh, nowadays uh, using other uh, 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 visions. Another uh, fact that I think is important, our shareholder, the state of Minas Gerais, is in uh, not a very good shape, financially speaking, but we are a non-economically uh, dependent platform. We are, that's recognized by the rating agencies. So we have a rating that is many notches above the state by S&P, uh, by Moody's, and therefore we are able to mobilize resources not only with development uh, agencies, multilateral, other national development banks, but we are just about to issue our first sustainable bond in the international market. We also raise funds through uh, local bonds and local uh, uh, green financial uh, instruments. So we are trying to use our creativity and all the instruments that are available to mobilize these resources to the very end of the uh, chain, which is the little guy living in a very small uh, city with lots of development challenges. And uh, we believe we are the platform to partner with both private and public institutions to reach and provide uh, that development and enable to fulfill the dream of the 2030 agenda. So thank you so much uh, to uh, trust uh, us uh, uh, today uh, in organizing this panel. We are really thrilled to be here participating. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, President Suchodolsky. I want to thank uh, all the panelists for the session that we had to run through a little bit. I'm very sorry for that, but your inputs were extremely uh, valuable. And I think we have had a very good uh, discussion about all the instruments that are already developed and used by the Submission Development Bank and how they relate to different scales of governments and to different players in the financial system. So I think we are, we're, as uh, President Suchodowski said, we have now a, a road ahead of us to continue uh, doing it better in order to build back better. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, you. enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you. Thank you.